Okay, cool. Today, my speech is going to be about this idea called analog computing. And it's this very interesting framework for how I think computers could completely transform in the future and really change the way we think about computers, phones, any kind of electronic devices that we wear today. And I think it's a very exciting idea that actually goes back to very old and very traditional ways of human calculation. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history behind this idea and the modern day implementations of it. So to begin, I wanna explain what exactly does analog mean? What does digital mean? And we can very easily think of just what an analog watch or clock means versus a digital watch or clock. But I wanna specify two ways we can really differentiate these two words. The first of which is that anything that's analog has a very physical and meaningful representation in the real world. What I mean by that is like in a clock, for example, the time is literally told by the movement of the hands of the clock. And while there are symbols on the clock itself, like one through 12, the real time itself is just shown by the physical locations of these two hands. Now contrast that to a digital clock where the actual clock itself can just be a box or a watch or anything. The physical manifestation is not relevant to us, but the symbols that are used to actually tell the time are ultimately what we pay attention to. And in this case, it's the numbers that we use for hours and minutes. So the difference here is that anything analog has a very physical meaning, whereas anything digital is based on a symbolic representation that doesn't actually have any physical tie to any kind of physical manifestation. Now, the second thing to pay attention to here is that an analog watch has a continuous time spectrum, meaning that even though we read time in terms of hours and minutes, the two hands on a clock can really tell you any given time between any two minutes or any two seconds even if you could really narrow down the precision of that watch. On the other hand, digital clock is inherently limited to discrete minute intervals. So it can never tell you between 10.30 and 10.31, it will always just give you something to the nearest minute. And so we have a very clear difference between a continuous spectrum on the analog side and a discrete spectrum on the digital side. Now, what's actually true is that analog computers have been here for a very long time. And there have been some brilliant implementations of analog computers in the past, but they've all had a very flawed characteristic because of how incredibly brilliant they were. This picture here, it's actually a video that I can play for you. It's from the YouTube channel Veritasium. And Veritasium is a YouTube channel about science education, but this specific YouTube video is actually about the history of analog computers. And the contraption shown in front of you here is actually what's called a harmonic analyzer, and it was built by Lord Kelvin. You might recognize the name Kelvin from the temperature scale Kelvin, and it's the same scientist who actually created this contraption. And he created it in order to have some kind of way to estimate the tidal flows around the earth. It turns out that a few years before, before Lord Kelvin, Pierre Laplace, another famous math mathematician, had actually come up with a set of equations to describe the tides around the, around the earth. But there was no easy way to solve these, these equations. And so nobody had a great way of mathematically estimating where the tides might be around the face of the earth. Now, what Lord Kelvin discovered is that the tides are actually controlled by a set of very specific astronomical frequencies. For example, the rotation of the earth around the sun or the revolution of the moon around the earth are both very fixed frequencies. And these frequencies contribute directly to the motion of the tides around the, around the earth. Now, we just need a way to estimate the contribution from each of these frequencies to the actual motions of the tides around the world. And so what Lord Kelvin devised in this contraption is actually a mechanical calculator that calculates for a given frequency, how much of that is actually contributing to the tides. And essentially, this is what's called a Fourier transform. It's figuring out how much of that eventual sinusoid or, or wave is attributed to a certain frequency. And I can play this video to you and, and you'll just see how simple and elegant it is, yet how complicated a calculation it can actually perform. So what we have here is in the center, we have a spinning disk and this disk can spin at some given frequency. Now, the graph on the very left is actually the function that we're trying to integrate, which is the basis of a Fourier transform. And as we move this pencil along this graph, this spinning ball moves along the spinning disk. And you can see that as it moves further from the center of the disk, the ball spins at a faster rate. And this is just a mechanical implementation. And the spinning motion of the ball then spins a roller, which then encodes 
the final output graph on the very right side. Now, this might seem like a lot of moving parts when you first look at it, but if you think about it, this is a very complicated mathematical calculation that takes years of calculus to learn and even understand. And the fact that you can implement it using basic objects like this, I think is how brilliant analog computers can really be. But analog computers have always had one major flaw, which is that they're optimized for this one specific type of calculation. For example, this contraption can only do this calculation. It can't add two numbers or multiply two numbers or anything else. And so while these computers are very brilliant, they're very niche. And so they're not widely applicable. Now, modern computers, as you might know, are mostly digital. And like I said earlier, digital computers are based on the notion of symbols. And for digital computers, the symbols are just zeros and ones, like in binary computation. And we've come up with this this framework for Boolean logic, where we can do these basic logical operations on zeros and ones, and then construct circuits to make any kind of numerical computation. Now, one thing I want to emphasize here is, even though you always hear about processors and computer chips that are implemented using transistors and, and physical devices, the actual physical devices aren't being used to add two numbers, for example. The, the actual number itself is being represented as a symbolic value for a voltage or a current. But the two voltages or currents or whatever are not actually being used themselves as numerical quantities. So there's a very symbolic calculation that's happening here without leveraging the true analog nature of these circuits. That's what's always been missing from digital circuits. But the reason these are so prevalent is because unlike those analog computers I was talking about earlier, these are very versatile. We can use any basic digital circuit to perform any number of computations. And so they're very widely applicable to any kind of computing framework. But digital computers have been slowing in progress in recent years due to something you might have heard of as the slowing of Moore's law. And I won't go into all the details there, but one thing to emphasize very imp importantly is that previously, we've always been able to reduce the power consumption of computer chips by making them smaller. And that progression has actually slowed down in recent years. So we're now facing a crossroads where we have to determine, is it really worth spending all this money and all this effort trying to shrink these chips to make them smaller when we're really not improving the power consumption of our chips. Now you might ask, you know, what's the issue with having a lot of power consumption in these chips? And the truth is that power consumption is directly related to heat. So if you have a very power hungry chip, it'll be very hot. And for example, you can't put it in a laptop computer because you'd never be able to use it at full capacity. So we have this fundamental trade-off with digital computing and it's reached a point where I think analog computers are actually making a comeback. And one area they're making a very strong comeback in is actually artificial intelligence. Now, the basic framework for artificial intelligence that I want to talk about is the neural network. And neural networks are made up of many moving parts, but the fundamental basic calculation in a neural network is like a matrix multiplication. And within a matrix multiplication, it's nothing but a series of additions and multiplications. So it's two very simple and very constrained operations, unlike any kind of normal scientific calculator you might hold in your hand. So we can leverage the fact that analog computers, while only good at one type of operation, are perfect for this exam for this kind of case, because we only need to perform these kinds of operations. And so we've seen a resurgence in analog computers that are more optimized for their application than traditional digital computers. And I'll end with just an example of one really cool modern computing theory in analog computing, which is this idea of photonic computing. Photonic computing is the idea that we can actually use light as a method of calculation. So the basic idea here is that instead of thinking of numbers or symbols, we're actually using light and multiplying it and adding it. And to give you an idea of what's going on here, let's look at this diagram that I drew with two sources of light, X and Y, that are coming in on the left-hand side. To do, the, to, to do the multiplication, we can pass these light sources through this contraption called an interferometer. And all an interferometer does is break up this piece of light and combine it in different ways, in different phases, so that it can either constructively or destructively interfere with each other. What you can think of this as is essentially a way to modulate the intensity of this light. In other words, you're weighting the light by a specific amount. And that's exactly what multiplication is. You're weighting a quantity by another given amount. Then after weighting these light quantities, we can then just simply combine them together using just normal um, mirrors and other optical contraptions to add them together. 
And then finally, we'll have an added and multiplied light source that we can then pass into a sensor to decode into some digital and numerical value. So scientists at MIT have actually built these kinds of computers, and they've noticed that these are much more powerful in terms of computation while being less power hungry than traditional digital computing frameworks. So I think it's very cool how the whole world of computing might actually be moving back to historical and traditional ways of analog computers that were up until now thought of as obsolete and impractical for today's purposes. I hope you all found this interesting.